Welcome everyone to the Brooklyn Book Festival. This year was our 15th anniversary and over the course of eight days, we've presented more than 100 author programs and discussions. We were thrilled to still be able to do this immense literary ce celebration despite the challenges of the year. I'm so pleased today to have with me iconic poet and writer, Sonia Sanchez, author of over 20 books, and she's joined by Kevin Young, director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture at the Smithsonian starting in January, and currently the director of the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture. He is also a poet. How does he do it all? We don't know. Um, anyway, I'm thrilled to have the two of us, to, two of them join us today, and I'm turning it over to them. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I hope you're well. Um, I'm such an honor to be back with Sister Sonia Sanchez, one of the great poets of our time and any time. Uh, I thought I'd start today uh, with reading first, and then Sister Sonia will read a poem, and then we'll start talking a little bit uh, about poetry, about history, and about the future. I'm going to start with a poem from uh, my book, Brown, which is my latest book. And it's from a sequence called De La Soul is Dead. I won't read the whole sequence. It's about 90s hip hop and blackness and uh, what it was like uh, then. The first poem in it is the one I'll read. It's a sonic called A Roller Skating Jam Named Saturdays. We were black then, not yet African-American. So we danced every chance we could get Thursday and Saturdays, we chant the roof, the roof, the roof is on fire. We don't need no water and folks' perms began to turn. We had begun to dread or wear locks anyway. Our temples, we'd fade. We said word and deaf said dang and down and fly. We gave no goodbyes, just all right then or bet. No one was dead yet. Mm. Sister Sonia. Uh, I, I chose uh, a little longer one, is that okay? Okay, and it's um, a recent poem that I did and I'm gonna begin with uh, additional text that was um, brought back to Philadelphia by Nadine uh, Patterson and Marlene Patterson uh, who did a short little uh, five minute um, film on a great woman by the name of Harriet Tubman. And this, this is at the Underground Railroad State Park and Visitor Center. And it says, we are free because of Harriet Tubman, December, 1850, Keziah Bowley, James Alfred Bowley, six years old, Araminta baby, John Bowley free, early 1851. Moses Ross brother, unidentified man, unidentified man, late 1851. Unidentified man called brother, unidentified wife of brother, unidentified, unidentified, un Identified, unidentified, 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 fall 1852. Unidentified, 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 June 1854. Winnebar Johnson, Christmas 1854. Robert Ross, Alias John Stewart brother, Henry Ross, alias William Henry Stewart brother, Benjamin Ross Jr., alias Jane Stewart brother, Jane Kane, alias Catherine Stewart, Peter Jackson, John Chase, unidentified, possibly George Ross, unidentified, possibly William Thompson, unidentified, unidentified, early 1855, Harry Ann Parker Ross, William Henry Ross, John Isaac Ross, William Henry Ross Stewart Sr., December 1855, Henry Hooper, Ra probably got it, May 1856, Ben Jackson, James Coleman, Henry Hopkins, William Conaway, October 1856, Tilly, November 1856, Bailey, William Bailey, Peter Pennington, Elijah Manarchy, 
May 1857, Harriet Green Ross, alias Harriet Stewart, mother, Benjamin Ross, alias Benjamin Stewart, father, November, December, 1860, Stephen Ennels, Maria Ennels, Harriet Ennels, Amanda Ennels, baby Ennels, John Corners, alias John Wesley Reed, unidentified woman, unknown dates, Margaret Stewart, Anne Marie Stewart, Amelia Hollis, Henry Carroll, unidentified twin girl, unidentified twin girl, unidentified, 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 unidentified. Haku and Tonka for Harriet Tubman. Picture a woman riding thunder on the legs of slavery. Picture a woman walking southern landscapes burning with moons. Picture her kissing our spines and no to the eyes of slavery. Picture her rotating the earth into a shape of lives becoming. Picture her leaning into the eyes of our birth clouds. Picture a woman moving in winter black, bringing summer moons. Picture this woman saying no to the constant yes of slavery. Picture a woman jumping rivers, her legs inhaling moons. Picture her ripe with seasons of legs running. Picture her tasting the secret corners of woods. Picture her saying, you have within you the strength, the patience and the passion to reach for the stars, to change the world. Imagine her words. Every great dream begins with a dreamer. Imagine her saying, I freed a thousand slaves, could have freed a thousand more if they only knew they were slaves. <laughs> Imagine her humming, how many days we got before we taste freedom. Imagine a woman asking how many workers for this freedom quilt Picture her saying, a live runaway could do great harm by going back, but a dead runaway could tell no secrets, could tell no secrets. Picture the daylight bringing her to woods full of birth moons. Picture John Brown shaking her hands three times saying, General Tubman, General Tubman, General Tubman. Picture her words, there's two things I got a right to death or liberty. Picture her saying no to a play called Uncle Tom's Cabin. I am the real thing. Picture a black woman could not read or write trailing freedom refrains. Picture her face turning southward, walking down a southern road. Picture this woman, freedom bound, tasting a people's preserved breath. Picture her singing red moons, surprising life. Picture this woman of royalty wearing a crown of morning air. Picture her walking, running, reviving a country's breath. Picture black voices leaving behind lost tongues. Picture her moon bent legs dancing inside freedom's guitar. Picture her painting rainbows on a summer bent people. Picture a woman Picture a woman, picture a woman walking on freedom legs, a sea spray of life, a sea spray of life. Mm -hmm. That's um, a new piece I did for Sister Harriet Tubman. Yeah. Great woman. That was incredible. A general. A general, yeah. <laughs> Wow, you really capture her uh, fierce spirit, I think. Mm -hmm. And I love hearing, um, I'm just gonna be a fan for a moment and I know I, I'm not alone out there. Um, I love the beginning with the unidentified, which is just so haunting. And of course you make that a name, you make that a, a, a nomo. And then in the second part, the, the picture, picture this, oh, that's so wonderful. And I think I'm, I'm in a I way, would, but, uh, uh, I recorded this, um, um, and you know I'm having uh, a little moment here. But I recorded this with without with um, uh, a, an amazing, 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 amazing um, bass player, Kristen McBride. You know, can you imagine? I, I listen to Kristen McBride, my dear brother, as an aside, and I think I can play the bass also too. We were on together, right? And he was so good, good getting so. I went over and started going like this, and he fell out laughing. I said, I really think I can play the bass also. But he is such a 
such a genius. I mean, like you're a genius, you know. Um, you. I got so tired of people calling everybody a genius. I mean, this was many years ago, more than 20 years ago. And I turned around on stage with everybody being called a genius and said, well, let me tell you the geniuses. And I did this litany of geniuses, right? And I add your name to it because you can't call all these other people geniuses and ignore, you know, you know living geniuses among you. Well, you, you, you foremost among them. I, I wonder uh, if, it changes a little bit what I want to talk about first, which mm -hmm. is thinking about musicality, because we were talking the other day mm -hmm. about musicality mm -hmm. and how important that was for Black arts and for you and your poetry to change poetry, really, and, and transform it. Um, mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about that moment? Uh, I assume it was organic. I assume it had something to do with jazz and the music around you, but also with the music of the streets and the, and the heartbeat and all the rest. Could you tell us about that moment for you of changing uh, poetry uh, your own or, or uh, black arts in general? The music, the music. Yeah, or, and getting it down on the page, which we talked about. Right, but you know, my dear brother, I, um, you know, I had, I, I was the youngest in the family, right? Um, and my sister, it, I was in a household uh, where my sister was a raving beauty. I mean, my sister would walk into a room and everybody stopped, you know, and just look. I would walk into the room, they said, hi, Sonia, you know, <laughs> and keep going, right? But my yeah. sister, uh, amazingly beautiful, and she had a voice also. So when my father, who was a musician, right, taught Papa Joe Jones how to play the drums, right, um, at the very beginning, um, you know, here I was uh, always, um, if, whenever we sang together, she had like the soprano part and they gave me like, you know, the male part, you know, because they said she can't sing anyway. So for me to finally use my voice, and you know how it happened, my dear brother, I, we, I was flying from New York to Brown University and they kept saying, we kept getting a delay. Finally, they got the pilot said, let's take off. The snow shouldn't hit us. But of course, the moment we got up, the snow smacked that little plane going to Brown, right? And, and we circle and circle forever. Is that a long flight? And finally he says, well, I guess I've gotten rid of all the fuel. We'll try to land now, right? So we landed at Brown. And you know what, Brown, to get to one of the, up on campus, you have to go up this high hill. And we're oh. in the car and the car didn't make it. So we got out the car and we trudged up the hill, but me with my briefcase before the roller bags, right? And the students had come in at eight and they were told the plane was late. And so they came back, they were, they were coming in at 11, 11 p.m. So I said very dramatically, since you're such a great audience and so, you know, and so bright, I will do a long reading. So I did read for an hour and a half, but I was whipped at that time, but they said one question, this brother up front raised his hands and uh, Professor Sanchez, uh, would you read, um, um, what was that poem? I, I, is that a middle passage or it was no Coltrane poem? And oh, I, Coltrane. I said, I've never read that poem. I've only written it, I've never read it. He said, I said, so I, you know, I can't, I'll read another one. He said, I like to see the, I like to hear the Coltrane poem. After all, we waited for you for three hours. That's why I love you, young people. You know, you come, you come back like, you know, shut up, woman. You know, like, you know, come on. And so I said, give me a minute to look at it. So I look at this poem, and here I have all this, all the directions to be sung: tap your feet, tap your belly, slap your head, whatever, etc. And I started very gingerly, right? Because I knew I had to sing at some point. And I do this poem. When I finish, there's a silence and I'm standing up there looking at this huge audience, right? With all the silence, I said, well, girl, you blew it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> reading what? a poem I never read. And then they got up and they stamped their feet, wherever that brother is. And you know, I hope he hears this, my talking, because I've said this on stages, you know, come up to me, write me a letter, because you are the, he was the one that made me realize that I could sing, that I could use that voice, right? That I could stretch words out, that I could shorten them, that I could, like, in a sense, um, make them, you know, a jazzy one, make them a, a, what I call a holy one also, too, at that point. And it was because he insisted that I do it, that I did it at that point. But, you know, I, I my dad was a musician. You no, know, so you no, know, I was in a house of musicians, right? I was in a house of music always. So I was always humming, but everyone would say, shh <laughs> to me, you know. But I knew that music was inside me, but I had been taught, girl, don't you try to sing. So I didn't. But at some point, 
you know, and you know this, the joy of being on stage sometimes, you know, that that stage will overtake you, you know, and the ancestors will overtake you and say, girl, sing, you can sing and you will sing. And that is the joy. Yeah. Um, well, I think so much about form too, obviously with poetry, but also with your beginning, uh, which I do want to talk about because people may not know, you started out in workshops with Louise Bogan and, and those kind of, uh, early workshops of yours, and you've talked so wonderfully about it. Could you give us just a little flavor of what that meant? Is it before the Coltrane poem or, or anything like that? Well, when I got out of the Hunter, you know, I, you know, I didn't have, they didn't have a lot of scholarships, so I could only afford to take two courses after, you know, undergrad, right? But I was always looking for a workshop. I had tried workshops all over New York City. Every time I walked into a workshop, there were about 12 men sitting there, and I was, I was the only Black and the only woman. And I sit there, and I raise my hand to say something. I would make a comment, no body responded. Now, you know, I, I mean, I was very much, um, you know, like re writing, like all the people I had read, you know, uh, you know, very, very, very formal kinds of things that I happened to have been writing right at that point. So I would drop out after three sessions, went to another one, I drop out after three sessions. And I was looking in the brochure there, and I saw Louise Bogan teaching a, a poetry class. So I didn't register, I kind of came in, set by the door, so I, so I know I'm going to leave here. And Bogan came in and she said, uh, sat down, she said, does anyone here have a, after we introduce ourselves, have a poem? Well, you know, that's like asking, you know, somebody, you know, who's a, you know, who's a drinker, if they got a bottle hidden someplace in the house, right? And we all, I went in my purse and pulled out mine. I said, let me raise my hand. Let me go up front. Let me make, see, see the turf. If it doesn't work, I'll drop out again and give up trying to do a workshop. So she called me and she made you come up front. I read this poem. The moment I finished hands with up, for the first time someone responded. It, and it was a class of all men and one other woman, uh, a young woman, uh, a, a young white woman and this black woman, whatever. You know, every now and then we look at each other and we sat, you know, you know, diagonally across from each other. And we used to just sit there and just look. But in Bogan's class, I spoke finally. And she commented on my piece. And so therefore, you know, she taught us four, my dear brother. You know, she taught us, you know, things I didn't want to learn because I figured I'm a free verse person, whatever. Right. But she right. taught us everything. First, the villanelles, whatever. And then she made us choose a form that we liked. And I, at the A Street bookstore, I was sitting there and I saw this beautiful book and I pulled it down. It was a book of haku. And so I did haku at the end of the semester. But what happened with me, with her, is that she would teach you uh, how to send poems out as a as a poetry editor of the New Yorker, she was, right? And and she said, said no more than three poems. I will not read anything after three poems, right? You know, if you if you don't get me in the first two or three, you will not get me in the fourth one, whatever. And so I began to do that. By midterm, I come home from teaching, I was teaching at the same time. Um, um, and I opened this, this envelope and there they had took, they had taken, a small magazine had taken three of my poems. So I went to the liquor store because I knew Bogue and also drank and got bottles of wine and took it to NYU. Can you imagine them? And we the bottles of wine and we sat down and we poured wine and we drank. And it was at that time I, I had, I got an appointment with her and I asked her, uh, Miss Bogan, um, do I have, I mean, is, am I wasting my time? Should I continue to write? Do I have talent? You know, I mean, should I, I asked about four questions in a row and she said, why do you want to know, Sonia? And I said, because Emma, I want to know if I'm wasting my time, right? And she said, and she told me a story about a close friend of hers in New York, right? That once a year, they would have dinner together and her friend would give her this very beautiful poem. She would read it. Louise Bogan would say, it's a beautiful poem. But that was it. You know, she didn't do, she didn't do what we do, that you write poems all the time, that kind of thing. And she finally turned to me and said, yes, you do, but what are you going to do with it? And I said, with my kind of fresh mouth, you know, I was 20 years of age, I said, I can figure that one out myself. Thank you. And I began to, you know, my publishing began right then and there. And 12 of us from that workshop, you know, met on Charles Street in the village for uh, about three years. 
And and that's when I I kept writing. The only you had to bring a poem weekly, right? And I would sit in my car sometimes writing parts of a poem so I could get up there. And that's what how it began. But just I want to say we would go from that Charles Street apartment to some of the the jazz clubs and one night we went into the jazz clubs and there was um uh, someone by the name of Leroy Jones Leroy Jones sitting there writing right with his hat sitting ace to juicy you no know, with some liquor on the table and someone said that's that's Leroy Jones I said yeah I know and I, I walked past and he said Sonia Sanchez and I jumped I literally jumped and I, I, you know, I'm a stutterer, you know. I mean, I don't say I'm an ex stutterer. You're always a stutterer, by the way, because it's always waiting for you at the base of your, you know, your your back and your base of your back, you know, your neck. And I turned around. He says, "I'm editing a journal coming out of Paris, France. Send me some of your work. You know where to send it to, Eugen, right?" And I said. <laughs> Yes, right. So we went in to hear some jazz. And he said, did you know that's Lee Will Jones? I said, yes. I said, is he going to sit? I said, no. I mean, you know, who, you know, this man doesn't know me from beans, right? And so I went on and a couple of weeks passed. We came back into the same jazz joint, right? And as we passed by, I saw him and kept going. He said, so you don't want to be in the journal, huh? And I turned around then and said, you were serious? He said, yeah, you know how you, yeah, I was serious. But I left my friends, I left the fellow poets, went, got in my Volkswagen, zoomed up the West Side Highway, sat down with my little Olivetti, you know, typed it up slowly, but I wouldn't take a chance. I came back out that night and mailed it down at the post office, right? And I got a letter from him, which was letters in my papers that said, Dear Sonia, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love that. That's yeah. amazing. Was that the first time you really had encountered him or you you ha didn't know him before then? Him around, but after that encounter, he invited uh, uh, me and some of the others to some of the plays that he was doing at the time, right? You know, and I also um, began began that 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 whole process of listening to poetry, you know, following uh, many of the poets down in the village, right? So I would kind of hang out down there also too. But I was, my dear brother, no one believes this when I said, but I think you would believe it. I'm shy. I mean, I talk a good talk on stage, but put me someplace in a party. If you ever, ever see me and I'm standing like this, because I don't know how to keep small conversation, you know, so. Right, right. I'm shy too, people don't believe I'm shy either. So I hope you believe me. I, I get a little shy sometimes. And I think some poets are this mix of shy and, you know, expressive. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes you see that even on the page, the way that poets play with silence. Uh, you know, people think, Poetry is, is all words, but you especially know it's those, that white space, those blank notes, that blank, black space, if you will. And uh, I think you're so wonderful at that. That's why I love jazz, because it, 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 it's the same thing. All the, all the spaces between the silences, I call it, right? Between the words, it's the same thing, the silences between the jazz, you know? So when I listen to jazz, like, I don't just listen to what they play. I listen to like the silence, like what was unsaid, what was unplayed. And that's the beauty of it also too, right? I think hip hop's the same way. I, I think I said something about that in a book of mine that uh, called The Grey Album, where I talk about hip hop, you know, it befriends silence, but also like fights it at every turn. It's part of its sort of relationship with silence. It's noisy, it's clanking, it's loud, it's humming, you know, uh, sirens and alarms, but it's also obsessed with that moment where you turn the beat off and <laughs> you're dancing and you might freeze or, you know, the breaks uh, in hip hop. So you express that so well. There's so much I want to talk to you about and follow about even just those stories. Uh, one of the, them is about Haku and how you fell in love with it. And I didn't realize it was as early as Louise Bogan's class, but could you tell us more about what you see in that form and what it does for you? Because you're such an expert and powerful uh, participant, a master you know, genius in that form. Sorry. You do know um, that, um, that a number of black writers wrote haku. When I started writing, I'm always of the opinion that somebody did it, be some black person had done it before me, right? 
and and so I went looking and during the Harlem Renaissance, people wrote the haku. I mean, just like, I don't know if you know that someone said to me, I did a reading in the village once and someone had brought some IRA people in, in from, from Ireland. And I do the litany of names sometimes. And I mentioned, you know, a number of, of the Irish uh, freedom fighters, right? And they were so surprised. And then I sat down with them and said, do you know that um, the poets, especially Hughes and others, the poets in, in the Harlem Renaissance uh, visited Ireland. If you go to Ireland, you'll see some of the names, you know, there on some of the streets, right? But they would, they sent money. And so what I did there that night, uh, I said, look, I, I'm one of these poor teachers, you know, I take care of everybody, you know, uh, you know, there's always one person who takes care of everybody in the family, right? And I said, but I know people who have money. So, so I will call them and ask them to send money over to, you know, to, to your IRA. And they were so surprised that simply that, you know, there had been this, 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 I don't know, this complete arrangement that had come all the way from the Harlem Renaissance to our time, you know, where we get, got, got up on the stage and I would mention, mention Bobby and all those people who had come before and the ones who had died, you know. Um, and I remember, I don't know if you remember um, that when I started mentioning some of the, 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 the the whites in my litany of uh, uh, revolutionary people, you know, people who had just been very important uh, to all of us uh, in America and the world, that some people got annoyed. Uh, uh, I said, so how can you put them all together? I said, because at some point you realize that, you know, anybody fighting for freedom should be, you know, you know put together. They should be in the same closet or the same room or this on the same land, whatever, et cetera. That was important to me for people to understand. And certainly the Irish, you know, there, you know, fighting, uh, you know, against the British at that particular point, right? They were people worthy, you know, uh, you know, to be put and 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 put right next to people who were fighting for freedom. Blacks were fighting for freedom in this country also too. Uh, the Haku, she sent us, you know, our last uh, thing that we had to do is that you would choose a form and write right. uh, poems, right? And I went to the A Street bookstore and I talk about it in here uh, at the beginning of the book of poetry. And I saw this beautiful book all the way up on the top shelf. And, and I asked uh, for a stool and I climbed up and I got, and it said H-A-I-K-U. And I went up and I said, is this Haku? And they said, I mean, I just want to make sure I wasn't, you know, going to pronounce it. Right, right. right. And I sat down. Initially, I sat down on, on the stool, but someone needed the stool. Then I sat, I slid down on, on the floor and started to read the Haku. And I started to sob because I saw, you know, I saw the beauty uh, in me. Right, you know, uh, uh, the beauty. And like one of the things that I say that I think is so uh, you know, it's so important at some point, you know, uh, every now and then I write it down at some point is that um, the haku is already written before you pick up the pen, period. It's already in your breath. Isn't that, I mean, the, the idea that it's already there. So th it is that split second in which things are profound. It is that split second that things are so beautiful and it will quickly disappear. But the haku is like a, a mantra for me. You know, in the morning, I write a haku a day. So my, my mantra in the morning when I get up with the papers that I lean over and I write something that I probably dreamed about, you know, and I don't remember, but the haku remembers it. That's the joy of it, right? And so I write it down, and of course I work on it later on. But that's you know, or, you know what what I do. Um, that profound sense of beauty. But you know, my dear brother, um, I, I I read the haku for the first time a lot at a place called Columbia University, right? At the end of a a very hard day for me coming in from Philadelphia, I had gone to see Professor Arthur. P. Davis uh, spent the, a lot of a couple of hours with him. Come up in snow to to Columbia University, and I ended up by reading some haku. At the end, uh, this guy raised his hand. So, I mean, why are you writing the haku? You you're not Japanese. I said, Oh, you figured that out, huh? And <laughs> you, know, you got it right. And I talked to him about 
the haiku, you know, you know, and that profound beauty, you know, that that one instant that you see the beauty of the sunset, you know what I'm saying? But I said, also, what I want to do with that haiku too, was not just imitate, but also be an original speaker, talker, writer of the haiku, right? Coming from a perspective that was a black perspective of one of color also too. And, and that's the beauty of it, I hope also too. Uh, so every time you turn around and look, you know, you can see the haiku. When I called home from China in 1973, before you were born. Um, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> or, you were, or you were very young. Uh, <laughs> I was young, I was young. Yeah. You know, and and to say hello to my children from at that time Peking, or Beijing, and I said to them, "It's Monday morning," and they turned to my aunt Sarah and said, "Aunt Sarah, mommy thinks that is it's Monday, but it's really Sunday." Well, <laughs> you know, how could I explain that to them at that time? But on the way to climb the Great Wall of China, I wrote a haiku that said, "Let me wear the day well, so when it reaches you, you will enjoy it." I was greeting the day before my children greeted the day. So it's important that I wear the day well. So by the time they got it, they would be obliged to wear it well. So I ended by reading at the University of Beijing uh, that same day, that same night. And I ended with that haku. I said, I've just been this haku here. And one of the officials stood up and said, ah, oh, Professor Sanchez, if he, we here in the East learn how to wear our days well, by the time you get the day in the West, perhaps we will have peace. The other part of haku is peace. There is no violence in that haku. And so that's why I like to teach the haku, teach it to young people that we're talking about a peaceful form, one that looks at sometimes things that are unpeaceful, but would bring it into that arena of peace at, the, at that same time, yeah. Well, I see you have the book there. I, I can't, you have to read us a few haiku uh, for us. You know, you know, Max Roach. Right, the great yes. Max Roach, right. And um, uh, if, bass player, I mean, uh, you know, drummers. Drummer, the great percussionist. And um, if you go and, and Google him, you'll see on his, um, on his tombstone that uh, uh, I, I read at his funeral, the, one of the haku that I read for him um, uh, is on his tombstone, which was such an honor that, that the Roach family allowed me. But, um, you know, if you go up, it's about 30 minutes from, from where my father used to live there at Lenox Terrace, uh, where I used to live there, 135th Street, is a cemetery um, where you go and you'll see the Woodlawn Cemetery. And there is Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, you know, uh, Illinois Jacket, Max Roach, you know, and at the top of the hill is, 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 is um, Theo Cruz, you know, the great singer there. He's in this big crib, right? And I said to Maxine, Sister Maxine, if things ever get tough, we can go in, in, in here in this crib, you know, right? You know, this was so wow. You could bring in a bed or a little cot, whatever, et cetera. But this is um, for Tim Haku for Max Roach. Nothing ends every blade of grass remembering your sound. Your sounds exploding in the universe return to earth and play. <laughs> As you drum, your hands kept reaching for God. The morning sky so lovely imitates your laughter. You came warrior clear, your music kissing our spines, feet tapping, singing in peach of blood. <laughs> You came drumming sweet life on sails of flesh. Your fast speed riding the air settles in our bones. Your drums soloing our breasts into the beat on beat, into the beat on beat, into the beat on beat, into the beat on beat. Your hands simmering on the legs of rain. Your hands. on the legs of rain. Yeah, that's Max, for Max Roach. I was watching him at um, uh, that last uh, haku was written when I was watching him uh, at the Blue Note and I was sitting right down in front and this piece of sweat started to move down and move down his face and hit, hit the cymbal, right, the drum. And that's when I wrote that 
that that last, you know, I had it and then I added other stuff to it later on. Right. Amazing. Yeah. That's incredible to hear you read. But you're right to name this this rich tradition. I, you know, I just did this anthology of African American poetry that you are prominent in. And I was just looking at it right now to see that uh, I think the earliest one I have is from Lewis Grandison Alexander from the 1920s, um, who wrote mm -hmm. a bunch of uh, what he called Japanese haku. Um, and it's, mm -hmm. it's just a beautiful tradition that you've extended and made all the more central and important. Uh, we only have about eight minutes left. So I want to ask you a one quick question. And then I want to hear some more poems because I know uh, I'm not alone and want to hear from you again. But I want to ask, because we were talking uh, once about the Schomburg Center, and you were, you were mentioned 135th Street. And so as a director there, and, and you know, it's a place that's sort of central for both of us, and you're a wonderful ambassador for it. Could you tell us that story about first going to the Schomburg uh, and your first experience uh, there and, and how it might have changed your, your poetry? Yeah, I was out of school. And my dad said, well, you're going to have a teaching job in September, so you need to get a job now because we gra graduate in January, right? And I went, I used to you know, send out ads and go down for jobs and they wouldn't hire me. So I answered an ad in the New York Times and I got a telegram. Your audience might not know what a telegram is, my dear brother, that said, I got it on Saturday, report to work on Monday. So I went around looking at my dad, right? Said, see, 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 I got a job writing because he was about, was about the only person and I guess who knew that I, you know, that I wanted to write, right? And so he said in a very droll fashion, well, you know, you know, you probably have to get another job. You, I'm not too sure about this, but I went there with the telegram and, you know, it said come arrive at nine o'clock, but I got that 8.30. I was waiting outside, you know, up, up, I got up the elevator and this woman comes down and she says, yes, can I help you? And I handed her the telegram. She looked at the telegram and she looked at me. She looked at the telegram and she looked at me. She looked at the telegram, she looked at me and she handed it back. She says, she opened the door, she said, come in. I sat down. I had on a blue hat, a blue suit, blue pumps, blue purse and white gloves. Man, I look good. Please, please. I mean, really clean, right? And I saw a face came around the door and another face came around the door. And this guy came in and he said, yes, can I help you? And I stood up and I handed him the telegram. And he looked at the telegram, he looked at me. He looked at the telegram and he looked at me. He looked at the telegram again and looked at me and said, I'm sorry, the job is taken. Well, you know, I come from New York with that New York humor. I said, oh, I got it. You said, come at nine o'clock. I came at 8.30, I'm gonna go outside. And I'll come back in at nine and everything to be okay. He did not laugh. He did not smile. He looked at me and said, I'm sorry, the job is taken. And then I said, I got it. Discrimination. I'm going to report you to the Urban League. And I left out, taking off my hat, gloves, everything, whatever. Got on the train, coming uptown. Didn't get off at 96th Street. The train stayed on the east side. I got off at 135th, came up the block, and there was a sign that said Schomburg. Never heard of the Schomburg. I'm a New Yorker. Never been to the Schomburg. Or oh, maybe had heard it, but never been there. Guy said, lady, go inside. I walk inside and there was this long, long table there and nothing but males, but books stacked high, scholars doing work. And there was this glass door down the hallway and I knocked on it and Miss Hudson opened the door and said, yes, my dear. And I told her my name. I said, what is the Chambre? She said, oh my dear, she said, this library has books only by and about Negroes. And I said with my fresh mouth, there must not be many books in here. <laughs> She never, ever let me forget that. When I brought my classes from Amherst, from Temple, wherever I was teaching, my dear brother, she would say, I have a story to tell you about your professor, <laughs> right? And that was old, right? And uh, she sat me down and she said, about 20 minutes later, she brought three books, All From Slavery, uh, Souls of Black Folk, and on top, their eyes are watching God. Well, I started to try to read their eyes are watching God, but you know, that black English, it is not, I tell people, you know, my all my, my grad students, it, it is not dialect, it is black English, right? Norman mm -hmm. wrote an essay in the Times to say it's black English, right? Um, and I said simply, okay, um, uh, my ears had to get attuned to it. So I started kind of reading it out loud and then I got accustomed to it. I got up after about maybe, about, I was about a fourth in the book and I knocked on the door and I had tears in my eyes. I was crying. I said, but how could I be an educated woman and not 
read this book. She said, oh my dear, I'm gonna give you lots and lots and lots of books, right, to read. And I sat back down, I read some more until I got to about a third of the book and I knocked on the door again. And she said the same thing. She escorted me this time and one of the scholars said, Miss Hudson, make this young woman sit down or she has to leave. And I sat down and every morning when I told my father I was going to look for a job, I came to the Schomburg and Miss Hudson read me book after book after book. And she sent me to Mr. Richard Moore at 125th Street uh, and, and the, uh, the brother who, who owned the book so with, with Malcolm outside, right? Right. Um, and they all gave me books. And I had read those books. So I, I would be dancing. I was in New York Court. I'd be dancing on the floor. And I would say, have you read Richard Wright? Whatever. And I turned around. People had left me. They were saying, that girl talking about that Black stuff all the time, right? And there I was, my dear brother, talking about books, um, reading books, you know, um, uh, living in the Schomburg for the rest of that whole winter and summer, you know, until I started to teach, you know, in the fall, the joy of it. Um, and so when someone said, we need someone to teach, because they weren't teaching those classes at the time, to teach this at San Francisco State, beginning Black Studies, they said, Sanchez, she's always talking about these books. She's always handing your books here. <laughs> I was read this book but Mr. Michonne gave me gave me this book and when you go down to your new position I have amazing tape that I did about three hours with Mr. Michonne about 125th street and his bookstore there okay and yeah. about I'll, I'll yeah, give it wonderful. yeah you, I mean you now are extending that tradition to everyone who's watching uh, this uh, conversation, but also at the Schomburg and beyond. It's such a treat to have you today. Uh, I think we're almost out of time, so I just would love to end, and I know everyone uh, would join me in hearing a poem of yours, one last poem. One last poem. Okay, something short, right? Sometimes <laughs> we do short, but, you know, whatever you, yeah. um, you've got. Yeah. Let's, I'll read the, um, the first part of the book that I did to, for my father and my brother, right? Um, and my brother, my brother who came north um, in a green suit at 17. And the first thing I thought is that I just got to get him out of that green suit. It, it wasn't a hip green suit that you would get at 125th Street. It was like one of those like, you know, like you know, green suits, right, whatever. And uh, you, you know that um, this is in, in Ron Royal, right? This is the sister speaking. This was a migration unlike the 1900s of black men and women coming north for jobs, freedom, life. This was a migration to begin to bend a father's heart again, to birth seduction from the past, to repay desertion at last. My brother came to destroy his northern family. Imagine him short and black, thin and mustache draping thin lips. Imagine him country and exact thin body, underfed hips, watching at this corral of battleships and bastards, watching for forget and remember, dancing his pirouette. And he came my brother at 17, recruited by birthright and smell, grabbing the city by the root with clean metallic teeth, commandant and infidel, pirating his family in their cell. And we waited for the anger to retreat. And we watched him embrace the city and the street. First, he auctioned off his legs, eyes, heart, and rooms of specific pain. He specialized in generalized, learned New York ease and all profane, enslaved his body to cocaine, denied his father's signature, damned his sister's overture, and a new geography greeted him, the Atlantic, drifted from offshore to lick his wounds to give him slim transfusion as he turned, changed war, a new waistcoat of solicitor, antidote to his southern skin, ammunition for a young paladin, and the bars, the glitter, the light, discharging pain from his bygone anguish of young black boys scared of the night. Sequestered on this new bank, he surveyed the fish, sweet cargoes, crowded with scales, fevers with quick sails, full sails of flesh, searing the coastline of his acquiesce and the days, rummaging his eyes and the nights, flickering through a slit of narrow bars, hips, thighs, and his thoughts, labeling him misfit, as he prowled, pranced in the starlit city, coloring his days and nights with gluttony and praise and unreconciled rights. My brother, 
coming to New York to live with his family. Um, you know, my brother coming to dam his northern family, but my brother, you know, um, uh, learning how to love his northern family, um, you know, as he moved and became one of the first black electricians, you know, in the electrical um, um, uh, union in a place called New York City, because I was in New York Corps, and we shut down Harlem Hospital and went to have a meeting with the union. And at three o'clock in the morning, they said, okay, 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 give us some names. And, you know, we had been you know, breaking down, you know, that place, but we didn't have any names with us. And I thought, my brother, he can put every little thing together, you know. And I said, I have a name, and I gave my brother's name. Um, and when I got home, my father, who had watched me downstairs at 100, 135th Street with the police coming on horseback, and he saw them coming, and we didn't see them, right? Lucky enough, the, I think the first Black lieutenant at that precinct was being driven to work and he had his car drive up. We had blocked the streets and he got out and said, what do you people want? Meaning us in New York Corp. And we said, we want blacks in the union in New York City. It's about time. And, you know, and that's what happened that day. So that night, my father called me at, at about five o'clock, 430 in the morning and said, Sonia, you got to stop being out in the streets. You almost got killed. And I said, I won't tell you how rude I was to my father because I was rude, you know. Uh, and then I said, but I need I need all the Wilson's information. We need to have him go down and show up at the union office, the electrical union's office, you know, at nine o'clock in the morning. And my father said, a job? I said, yes, that's what we're fighting for. Jobs, jobs, jobs. And that's what he was one of the first uh, blacks in the electrical union there. Oh, I love really? that story, you know. Yeah, well, and you capture it in that poem and in that form so mm -hmm. beautifully. And uh, thank you so much for all you've done for poetry, for us, for Black folks, for everyone. And uh, I know um, I'm not alone in, in thanking you and, and singing your praises. So uh, it's great to hear your work and be with you for a little while. We're going to talk soon, I hope. Um, I also have to say that as the poetry editor of the New Yorker, I, you can send me more than three poems. I'm, please. <laughs> All right. All right. I think that's our time. We'll come full circle with Bogan, by the way. I'm full full circle. Yeah. Yes. It's so Thank wonderful you. to see you. I'll see you soon, okay? Oh, my dear brother. Okay. Y'all be safe and stay stay well. Thank you. And I'm still telling people they have to join the Schomburg, okay? Yeah. <laughs>